welcome fellow stardust thank you for joining me today for another episode of true crime and nails today i'm going to talk about the movies and shows that richard ramirez has been depicted in some depictions were pretty accurate and others were more so inspired by ramirez even though the characters share the same name as the notorious killer these nails were done with IBD Builder Gel, Beetle's Black Gel Polish, and some black rhinestones. Let's get into it. A serial killer comes about by circumstances and like a, a recipe, poverty, drugs, child abuse. When these things, it, it, you know, are, contribute to a person uh, to a person's frustration and anger. And, uh, and uh, at a, some point in life, he explodes. The first movie is Manhunt, Search for the Night Stalker. Richard was arrested in August of 1985 and was finally convicted of all charges in 1989. This film was released the same year. At the time, it was the most expensive trial in history, costing $1.8 million. That's $3.7 million today. Then came the O.J. Simpson case, which cost around $5 million, just over $9 million today. This movie was fun to watch because they stayed almost completely true to all of the facts on both Ramirez's side and the detectives. The point of view is of the actual detectives who worked on tracking down Richard, Gil Carrillo, and Frank Salerno. The story begins in 1985. By this time, he has already committed a couple of murders and countless crimes. The first attack we see is of victims Maria Hernandez and Dale Okozaki. The way it was portrayed was a little inaccurate according to my research. In the scene, we have Richard sneak into the garage after Maria gets home. He shoots her immediately at point blank. She runs out of the garage and into the front yard while he goes inside to shoot Dale. Once we hear the gunshot, he walks out of the front door and sees Maria. She begs for her life and he ends up not shooting her and walks away. While it's true that Maria did survive the attack because the key in her hand blocked the bullet. She did not get up after being shot. She stayed on the ground and played dead. Richard then kicked her and walked over her body to get inside of the house. After shooting Dale, he left to go claim his next victim, who we see him attack in the next couple of scenes. The next murders after this happen quickly. You can look at the list of Richard's victims and follow them down the line as he commits his murders in the film. This first attack we see of Maria and Dale was certainly not his first act of violence. Before that incident, he attempted to rape a customer at a hotel he worked at when he was 15, but her husband walked in and chased him away. The couple never returned to Texas to testify against him, so the charges were dropped. He had also raped and killed a nine-year-old girl in the basement of the hotel he was staying in, soon after he moved to LA. Richard had been arrested many times before for drug possession. After the Maria and Dale incident, it seems like something snapped and he began committing the attacks one after the other, which is nicely depicted in this film. The actor they chose, Gregory Cruz, to play Richard, I think was an excellent choice. Even if he doesn't look exactly like Richard, he sounded just like him and the way he portrayed someone who hears voices in his head was so believable. And his teeth were good and nasty. Speaking of his teeth, this brings up another point. They certainly doctored up the whole thing with the dentist office to make the detectives look not as bad. This was a point in the investigation that the police could have captured him much sooner. Richard's teeth were literally rotting in his skull. It was so bad that many of his victims recall the horrible smell of his decaying teeth. His bad dental hygiene started when he was a kid. Like many Americans, he was addicted to sugar and wouldn't brush his teeth. 
His friends would complain to him about his bad breath. During their investigation, detectives were able to find out that Richard made an appointment with a dentist. They decided they would stake out the dental office until Richard showed up. They figured that even if he missed his appointment date, that he would eventually go back to the dental office to take care of his impacted tooth. However, it had been days and he still didn't show up and detectives no longer wanted to put money into having officers standing around the dental office. So they put in an alarm for the dentist to use for when Richard finally did show up. The very next day after installing the alarm, Richard showed up to the dental office. The dentist called the officers that day, asking them why they hadn't shown up because he had been ringing the alarm. Unfortunately, the alarm malfunctioned and they never got the signal. In this movie, they arrest someone who looks like Ramirez outside the dental office and they never go back, as if to say Richard never showed back up. The ending got me a bit emotional. Even though I've read about the citizen's arrest of Richard so many times, watching it being played out was a different experience. This is why I love movies so much. People were in fear every day of this man, with him choosing his victims at random. Anyone was up for grabs. Watching his murder spree come to an end at the hands of the same people who were frightened of him all summer made it that much more satisfying. Overall, this is a great representation of the events that happened for the time frame that they showed. I'm still looking forward to a good narrative telling of his childhood and his four-year trial. I don't care about myself, really. No, I don't care about what happens to me. I never did, really. I, I believe in a, in a malevolent being. Uh, his description eludes me, but I, I have felt powers that are evil. Next, we have Night Stalker from 2002, written and directed by Chris Fisher. As a big fan of Requiem for a Dream, Spun, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, and other films like these, I really enjoyed the artistic take on Ramirez's point of view. This was the perfect intro for a film about a sadistic addict serial killer. The movie opens with him driving, high on drugs. He ends up under a bridge with a sex worker, and because he has a foot fetish, she is giving him her best foot poses. The music, jittery camera, and fast motion create a sense of chaos and confusion. Richard is being followed by Satan, or you could say that he's possessed by him and we sometimes see Satan morph into the body of Richard. Richard was a known Satanist and did a lot of drugs. When he broke into homes to murder and rape whoever was there, he would take the valuables in order to pawn them for drug money. This film really focuses on his drug use as well as the drug use of everyone else in this world. While I like some aspects of the film, this is not a true representation of the events that went down. This film received a lot of low ratings, and most of them were complaining about how this isn't the actual story of Richard Ramirez. The writer basically just used Richard's name and some of the horribly violent stuff he did and inserted it into this story that he made up. The film would have been more successful if he had named the serial killer something else. Knowing that people are crime-obsessed junkies like myself and know every little fact about Richard Ramirez and are going to watch this film, it would make sense to do what the Dahmer and Gacy movies did, which was delivered a biography, not fan fiction. So we have this Richard guy going around killing people like we know Ramirez to have done. And then we have the perspective of the police and homicide detectives. The story between the two police officers and the two detectives is completely fiction. It was a fine story, but it had nothing to do with Richard Ramirez. One thing that irritated me about the writing was the fact that Detective Martinez starts out as an annoying cop, but only a few scenes later were supposed to be on her side. And it's easy to switch sides because she is likable, but why make her out to be so unlikable in the beginning? 
her acting was great. I'm glad to see that she's been doing a lot of work since this film. Danny Trejo played a good corrupt cop who was sort of, kinda good. I liked what the writer-director achieved. It's a good film. He plays on what Richard Ramirez once said. We are all evil in some form or another, are we not? And while we see the camera jerks and head spins when Richard does his drugs, we see other characters like the detectives, cops, and news reporters also being shown with these same camera jerks and head spins when they do their drugs and drink alcohol on the job, thus illustrating that Richard might be right to some degree, that we are all evil in our own way. The ending was a huge letdown, even though I was already settled into the idea that this was fan fiction mixed with a tiny bit of non-fiction. The movie as a whole was more about Martinez than it was Ramirez by two to three percent. So the ending was also more about her than him. Overall, it was an entertaining film. They just needed to change the name of the serial killer. I believe in the in the evil in human nature. This is a wicked, wicked world. And uh, in a wicked world, you, you, wicked people are born. I'm not gonna blame society, or my race, or people, or anything. Uh, it, it is up to the individual like myself uh, to, to keep on knocking on, on whatever door they wanna get into. 14 years later, there was The Night Stalker in 2016. This film is just like the previous film. A whole lot of fiction mixed with some non-fiction. Which again, fine. I like these artistic approaches to telling the story of an infamous serial killer. But I think just maybe don't name the film and the character after that person exactly. It's a bit annoying to walk into a film expecting something and getting something completely different. Or if you don't know anything about the actual serial killer, you walk out of the movie believing a lot of false facts. It's just a bit strange. But with that said, like Night Stalker, this was a very well-made film, and I enjoyed watching everything play out. I was interested and wanted to see where things went because of all I know about Richard Ramirez. Also because I love seeing where writers take their fictional horror slash thriller stories. But it also was another letdown as far as looking for a new accurate telling of Richard Ramirez's life. As of right now, Manhunt is the best depiction of that terrifying summer in 1985. We get an awesome glimpse into the childhood with this film, The Night Stalker. But I definitely wanted more and there were moments they cut corners and accuracy, probably because of time restraints. The capture of Ramirez at the end escalated a bit too quickly. It was a missed opportunity to really build the emotion of the audience because things get urgent and chaotic in only about two seconds. Whereas in Manhunt, the mob trickled in little by little which is a more true depiction of how things happened. The scene was still done well as far as direction, music, and acting, and it was still able to give us that satisfying feeling of Ramirez's end. This was another fine story that was executed wonderfully but just should have had a different name. Making these last two films is like making a Chris Watts movie where he's caught because somebody saw him burying his family and they went to the police and then Chris went on the run. It's just not what happened at all. People in this day and age are brainwashed and programmed like a computer at being nothing more than puppets. This nation, this country is founded in violence. <sighs> violent delights tend to have violent ends. It's Madness is something rare in individuals, but in groups, people, and ages, it is a rule. Killing is killing, whether done for duty, profit, or fun. These next titles are the shows and documentaries that he's been depicted in or was the subject of. There are countless documentaries about Ramirez on YouTube, but I'm not counting any of those. Like the movies were, these will also be listed in chronological order. First up is a documentary by Biography, released in 2001. I wasn't able to find this documentary, so if anybody else knows where it might be, 
please let me know. In 2011, the British TV show Born to Kill explored whether serial killers were born killers or were created by their environments. After talking about the gruesome murders committed by Ramirez, they delve into his childhood. In my first video about Richard, I talk about how I feel that he was definitely a product of his environment, as well as could have suffered from brain damage in the womb. His mother worked in a factory where there were a lot of chemicals up until she was five months pregnant with him. He was the last of five children, and his siblings were born with defects that affected their lungs and bones. When he was two years old, he was knocked unconscious by a bookshelf and suffered head trauma. His second head injury was when he was five years old and was knocked out by a swing. When he was 10, he began to suffer from seizures and was diagnosed with epilepsy. This is the time that experts believe this is when he started to have his delusions of monsters. He was also beaten regularly by his father. On one occasion, he was handcuffed to a tombstone overnight at a nearby cemetery, a place where he would also escape to on especially bad nights with his father. His drug use started when he was around 11, and he was exposed to even more violence by his Vietnam War veteran cousin, Mike. Mike trained him how to be stealth and how to hunt. He showed Richard photos of his conquests overseas, photos of beaten and decapitated women. One day, Richard witnessed his cousin shoot his wife point blank because she was complaining about him being lazy. Mike only spent four years in prison. He was let off on an insanity plea. When Richard turned 18, his drug use escalated and he was on his own. This was pretty much his point of no return. He had just moved to LA as a transient living between two hotels and really starting to get into Satanism. This episode of Born to Kill does a good job of telling Ramirez's backstory. I didn't particularly care for people, whereas if, where if I didn't give in to them, I would be crushed by them. American Horror Story actually had two Richard Ramirez characters in two different seasons. In Hotel, Season 5, Episode 4, Devil's Night, Richard Ramirez attends an annual dinner at the Cortez. In real life, Richard died of B-cell lymphoma cancer in 2013. In the show, the year is 2016, so this is his third dinner. He's joined by the hotel's creator and owner, James March, played by Evan Peters, who is also deceased along with Eileen Warnos, John Wayne Gacy, Jeffrey Dahmer, and the Ten Commandments Killer, who was supposed to be inspired by H.H. H. Holmes. This episode was a sort of break from the storyline. It's almost a standalone episode from the rest of the season, so we only see Richard in this episode in the entire season. When Richard checks in as an elite guest, his swag bag includes a couple sleeping soundly in their hotel room, primmed and ready for him to kill. The murder of this couple included some of his methods from a few different of his murders. There was the electrical spark from the lampshade when trying to strangle the woman, him telling his victims to say, I love Satan, and him bludgeoning someone's head to a pulp. During the dinner, he talks a bit about his childhood, which was pretty accurate. This entire season takes place in a hotel that is inspired by the Cecil Hotel. A hotel that is said to have had paranormal events go down as well as other disturbing things like homicides, suicides, and assaults. Richard Ramirez was even known to have stayed at the Cecil Hotel not long before his arrest in Los Angeles. Hotel Cortez is overseen by a fashionable vampire, Lady Gaga, and the owner, Evan Peters, who is essentially now haunting the place. James March, Evan Peters' character, apparently has trained all of these serial killers to become one of the quote-unquote greats, whose legacy will live on forever. So, every year, he has a dinner in their honor. This was a fun portrayal of Richard Ramirez and the other serial killers. They were definitely being made fun of and were not glorified. We are all evil in some form or another, are we not? Yes, I am evil. Not 100%, but I am evil. 
However, in season 9, 1984, they definitely glorified Richard Ramirez. Personally, I enjoyed this season of AHS, but when I sat and thought about it, they definitely did make Ramirez into a cool guy, even though he was murdering people throughout the season. Filmmakers and writers still have to keep in mind that Richard Ramirez had a lot of survivors of his attacks, and most of them are still alive. So portraying this man as sexy, cool, and dangerously interesting can easily be seen as insensitive. They also would have benefited from just changing his name and letting the inspiration speak for itself. But this guy looked exactly like Ramirez, minus his rotting teeth. Similar to Night Stalker, we get more of a look at his possession by Satan and get into his mind a little more, which was fun to see. Even though he was married to that weirdo Doreen Leoy, it seemed a bit off seeing him with a couple of love interests since he obviously had no respect for women. This season paid homage to 80s slasher films and was heavily influenced by Sleepaway Camp, Friday the 13th, and Halloween. So throwing in a young Richard Ramirez totally seemed like the move. We do get some accurate history about Richard, but toward the end, we really start to see some supernatural stuff that Richard probably thought was happening in real life. The American Horror Story character is able to conjure up Satan and even come back to life when he's killed. In one of his kill scenes, we see a group of people who have abandoned together to take him down. They stab and beat him to death, much like I'm sure the citizens who captured him in real life wish they could have done instead of turning him over to the police. Also, instead of Richard praising the quote, great serial killers before him, like the Hillside Stranglers, he was being praised by an up-and-coming serial killer, played by Dylan McDermott. While I believe they tried in some ways to again make fun of serial killers, they also inadvertently gave them a little bit of affirmation. Evil has always existed. Perfect world most people seek shall never come to pass, and it's gonna get worse. The great epochs of our life is when we gain the courage to rebaptize our e evil qualities as being our best qualities. I'm sure you've seen the last show I'm going to mention on Netflix, Night Stalker, The Hunt for a Serial Killer. The main goal of this limited docuseries was to not glorify Ramirez. The director didn't want to give the audience any opportunity to sympathize with him. His main focus was the victims. Even though he was charged with 13 murders, there were still many people who had survived his attacks. Many of them were featured in this series and were able to tell their side of the story. I liked the filmmaking in this documentary. The dramatizations really made me want to watch this full movie if they were to ever make one. Even all of the talking heads were done so well. I just really like how they were lit. Definitely rush to see this one if you haven't already. And if you really want to get deep into the minds of the main detectives on the case and the minds of the victims and their family members. We took a, a woman in her 60s and stomped her to death with his foot leaving an imprint of a shoe on the side of her face. Uh, from that to just executing somebody upon walking into a room after he entered a house. He strangled, he used a ligature, he used a tire iron on a, on a young girl, a beater left her for dead. Thank you again for joining me today, fellow Stardust. I'll be back with another episode of True Crime and Nails in two weeks. Until then, I'll be uploading a couple of movie reviews and other fun content. I hope I see you again soon. Alright my friend, peace. Yay.